Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe if you would like to receive daily updates about audiobooks. Feel free to leave book suggestions in the comments section. Living in the Light A Guide to Personal and Planetary Transformation By Shakti Gawain Chapter 9 Men and Women We all instinctively understand the basic functions of feminine and masculine energies, but we may not realize that they both exist in each person. More often we tend to associate male and female energies with their respective body types. Thus, women have become the symbols of female energy. Traditionally, women have developed and expressed receptivity, nurturing, intuition, sensitivity, and emotion. In the past, many women more or less repressed assertiveness, direct action, intellect, and the ability to function effectively and strongly in the world. Likewise, men have become the symbols of male energy. Traditionally, they have developed their ability to act in the world strongly, directly, assertively, and aggressively. Many men repressed and denied their intuition, emotional feelings, sensitivity, and nurturing. As we cannot live in the world without the full range of masculine and feminine energies, each sex has been helplessly dependent on the other half for its survival. From this perspective, each person is only half a person, dependent on their other half for its very existence. Men have desperately needed women to provide them with the nurturing, intuitive wisdom, and emotional support without which they unconsciously know they would die. Women have been dependent on men to take care of them and provide for them in the physical world, where they haven't known how to take care of themselves. It might seem like a perfectly workable arrangement, men help women, women help men, except for one underlying problem, as an individual, if you don't feel whole, if you feel your survival depends on another person, you are constantly afraid of losing them. What if that person dies or goes away? Then you die, too, unless you can find another such person who is willing to take care of you. Of course, something might happen to that person also. Thus, life becomes a constant state of fear in which the other person is merely an object for you, your supply of love or protection. You must control that source at any cost, either directly, by force or superior strength, or indirectly using various manipulations. Generally, this happens subtly, I'll give you what you need so you will be just as dependent on me as I am on you, so you will keep giving me what I need. So our relationships have been based on dependency and the need to control the other person. Inevitably, this leads to resentment and anger, most of which we repress because it would be too dangerous to express it and risk losing the other person. The repressing of all these feelings leads to dullness and deadness. This is one reason why so many relationships start off exciting, wow. I think I've found someone who can really fulfill my needs, and end up either filled with anger or relatively dull and boring, they aren't fulfilling my needs nearly as well as I had hoped, and I've lost my own identity in the process, but I'm afraid to let go for fear I'll die without this person. Finding the Balance In recent times, of course, the strongly separated roles of men and women have begun to shift. In the last two generations, increasing numbers of women are exploring and expressing their abilities to act in the world. At the same time, a growing number of men have been looking within themselves and learning to open to their feelings and intuition. I believe this is happening because we have reached a dead-end street with our old-world relationships and externalized concepts of masculine and feminine. The old models and ways of doing things are too limiting for us now, and we have not yet evolved effective patterns to take their place. It's a period of chaos and confusion, pain and insecurity, but also of tremendous growth. We are making a leap into the new world. I believe that every form of relationship, from the most traditional marriage to homosexual or bisexual relationships, represents each person's attempt to find their feminine-slash-masculine balance within. Women have traditionally been in touch with their female energy but they haven't backed her up with their male energy. 
They have not acknowledged what they know inside. They have always acted as if they were powerless when they are really very powerful. They have gone after external validation, from men especially, rather than internally validating themselves for what they know and who they are. Many women, like myself, have had strongly developed male energy but have used it in the old male way. I was very intellectual, very active, and drove myself very hard to shoulder the responsibilities of the world. I also had a very strongly developed female, but I didn't put her in charge. In fact, I ignored her a lot of the time. I basically protected my sensitive, vulnerable feelings by erecting a tough outer shell. I've had to learn to take that powerful male energy and use it to listen to, trust, and support my female. This allows her the safe, tie and support to emerge fully. I feel and appear softer, more receptive, and more vulnerable, but I am really much stronger than before. Women are now learning to back themselves up and validate themselves, instead of abandoning the responsibility and trying to get a man to do it for them. However, it's a deep-seated pattern that has endured for centuries, and it takes time to change it in the deepest layers. The key is to just keep listening to, trusting, and acting on our deepest feelings. The qualities that women have looked for in men, strength, power, responsibility, caring, excitement, romance, must be developed inside of ourselves. A simple formula is this, just treat yourself exactly the way you would want to be treated by a man. The interesting thing is that what we create within us is always mirrored outside of us. This is the law of the universe. When you have built an inner male who supports and loves you, there will always be a man, or even many men, in your life who will reflect this. When you truly give up trying to get something outside yourself, you end up having what you always wanted. For men, of course, the principle is exactly the same. Men are, traditionally, disconnected from their female energy, thereby disconnected from life, power, and love. They've been out there in the world secretly feeling helpless, alone, and empty, although they pretend to be in control and powerful. War is a good example of the old male energy lacking the wisdom and direction of the female. Men seek nurturing and internal connection through women but once they have connected with their own inner female, they will receive her incredible love from within themselves. For men, all the qualities you've wanted from a woman, the nurturing, softness, warmth, strength, sexuality, and beauty, already exist in your inner female. You will feel this when you learn to listen to your inner feelings and support them. You need to totally respect and honor your inner female energy by acting on your feelings for her. Then, every woman, every person, in your life will mirror that integration. They will have the qualities you've always wanted, and they will also receive love, warmth, nurturing, and strength from you. Many men, especially in recent times, have chosen to connect deeply with their feminine energy and, in doing so, have disconnected from their male. They've rejected the old macho image and have no other concept of male energy to relate to. These men are usually so afraid of their male energy, fearing that it will burst forth with all the old mindlessness and violence they equate with maleness, that they reject the positive, assertive male qualities as well. I feel it's very important for these men to embrace the concept of the new male, one who allows his spontaneous, active, aggressive male energy to flow freely, knowing that the power of his feminine is in charge, wisely directing him. This requires a deep trust that the inner female knows what she's doing and won't allow anything destructive or harmful to happen. New World Relationships A new idea of relationships is emerging that is based on each person developing wholeness within him or herself. Internally, each person is moving toward becoming a fully balanced feminine-slash-masculine being with a wide range of expression, from softest receptivity to strongest action. Externally, most people's style of expression will certainly be determined strongly by which type of body they are in, male or female. 
When people hear these ideas they sometimes express the fear that we will all become outwardly androgynous, men and women all appearing pretty much the same. The reverse is actually true. The more women develop and trust their male aspect to sup, port them and back them up internally, the safer they feel to allow their soft, receptive, beautiful feminine aspect to open up. The women I know who are going through this process, myself included, seem to become more feminine and beautiful even while they are strengthening their masculine qualities. Men who are surrendering and opening fully to their female energy are actually reconnected with the inner feminine power which enhances and strengthens their masculine qualities. Far from becoming effeminate, the men I know who are involved in this process become more secure in their maleness. In the new world, when a man is attracted to a woman, he recognizes her as a mirror of his feminine aspect. Through her reflection he can learn more about his own female side and move through whatever fears and barriers he may have to come to a deeper integration within himself. When a woman falls in love with a man, she is seeing her own male reflected in him. In her interactions with him she can learn to strengthen and trust her masculine side. If you know on a deep level that the person you're attracted to is a mirror of yourself, you cannot be overly dependent on him or her because you know that everything you see in your partner is also in you. You recognize that one of the main reasons you're in the relationship is to learn about yourself and deepen your connection with the universe. So, healthy relationships are based on the passion and excitement of sharing the journey into becoming a whole person. This might sound like we are evolving to a place where we are so whole within ourselves that we no longer need relationships at all. The paradox is this, as human beings, we are social, interdependent creatures. We do need one another. Part of experiencing wholeness is accepting the parts of us that need love, closeness, and intimacy with one another. So, creating conscious relationships involves honoring both our dependence and our interdependence. Gay Relationships My own experience in relationships is heterosexual, so I can hardly consider myself much of an expert on gay relationships. However, from talking and working with quite a few gay and lesbian friends and clients, I do have a strong sense that on a spiritual level, homosexual and bisexual relationships are a powerful step that some beings take to break through old, rigid roles and stereotypes to find their own truth. For some people, being in a close, intense relationship with a person or persons of the same sex is the most powerful mirroring process they can find. Two women, for example, often seem to find a depth of connection with each other that they don't find with a man. They use this intuitive feminine connection to create a strong foundation and safe environment for each of them to practice building their internal male. They totally reflect and support each other in becoming whole and balanced. A man sometimes seems to find a matching male intensity with another man, an ability to go all out that he wouldn't find with a woman. He may also find in another man a support for moving into and exploring his feminine self without feeling he has to fulfill the old, stereotyped male role. I think many of these things are mysteries that we will understand only in retrospect. I believe that every being chooses the life path and relationships that will help him or her to grow the fastest. As we continue to evolve, I believe we will gradually stop categorizing ourselves and our relationships with any particular label such as gay, straight, and so on. I foresee a time when each person can be a unique entity with his or her free-flowing style of expression. Each relationship will be a unique connection between two beings, taking its individual form and expression. No categories are possible because each one is so different and follows its own flow of energy. Exercise Think of some of the most important women in your life. What are their strongest or most attractive qualities? Be aware that they mirror some aspects of your own female energy, whether you are a woman or a man. Now think of some of the most important men in your life. What qualities do you most like, admire, or appreciate about them? Recognize that they reflect similar aspects of your own male energy, again, 
this applies to you whether you're a man or a woman. If you have trouble seeing that some of the things you admire in others are in you as well, it may be because you have not yet developed those qualities in yourself as strongly as they have. In this case, try the following meditation. Meditation. Get in a comfortable position. Close your eyes, relax, take a few deep, slow breaths and move your consciousness into a deep, quiet place inside. Bring to mind one person whom you admire or are attracted to. Ask yourself what qualities you find most attractive in this perked son. Do you see those same qualities in yourself? If not, try imagining that you possess those same qualities. Imagine how you would look, talk, and act. Picture yourself in a variety of situations and interactions. If you feel these are qualities you want to further develop within yourself, continue to do this visualization regularly for a while. Chapter 10 East and West, a new challenge. I have a strong feeling that in my last life I was a spiritual ascetic, perhaps in India, and probably living in meditation on a mountaintop somewhere. That way of life has a comfortable familiarity to it, and there is a longing somewhere within me to continue to live in that blissful simplicity. However, I know that this time I have chosen to take it to the next level, to integrate the spiritual, mental, emotional, and physical aspects of my being and learn to live in balance in the world. It is interesting to look at the world from the perspective of male and female, or spirit and form, in doing so I have discovered some fascinating things. In a sense, the East can be seen to represent the feminine polarity. Many of the Eastern cultures have an ancient and powerful spiritual tradition. Until recently, their strength and development have been primarily in the intuitive and spiritual realms, at least in comparison with the Western world. They have lacked development in the physical realm and, as a result, they have experienced a great deal of poverty, chaos, and confusion. The energy in the West, Europe and the United States, is more masculine. In modern history it has focused primarily on developing the physical realm while paying little attention to spiritual development. As a result, we have made incredible technological progress but we are experiencing a terrible poverty of spirit, a feeling of disconnection from our source. These two worlds are drawn to one another just as men and women are, with a certain amount of fear and distrust, but an overwhelming attraction nonetheless. Eastern spiritual teachings are flooding the West, and Western technology is gravitating toward the East. We are each hungry for what the other has. One of my favorite mental pictures of my travels in India is this, I was standing in a bazaar. In front of me were two booths. One booth had beautiful traditional handcrafted items for sale. A group of Europeans and Americans were crowded around it, eagerly bargaining for the lovely treasures. The other booth proudly displayed a variety of plastic items, bowls, kitchen utensils, even plastic shoes. A long line of Indians patiently waited their turn to purchase these precious things. Naturally, neither one of the groups cast even a second glance at the other booth. East and West can learn from each other, but like women and men, they must ultimately find within themselves that which they admire in each other. Hopefully, the developing third world countries will learn from our mistakes and develop a technology that is more harmoniously attuned to the spirit and the environment. And we in the West must develop a spiritual path that helps us to deal with the physical world. The Eastern spiritual traditions, and our Western spiritual traditions, as well, for that matter, are based on removing oneself as much as possible from the world in order to connect more deeply with the spirit. The world, with its temptations and distractions, is a very difficult place to maintain a focus on, and commitment to, inner truth. Thus, most serious traditional spiritual paths have involved some degree of renunciation of the world, relationships, money, material possessions, pleasures, and luxuries have been given up. The ideal has been to withdraw to a monastery or mountaintop and pursue a life of quiet contemplation, giving up all attachment to the world.
Even those who choose to remain householders with families and jobs have usually followed strong rules and restrictions that are designed to keep them as separate from the world as possible. This contemplative spiritual orientation has been a necessary and powerful step, but it is reflective of the split we have maintained between spirit and form, between the female and male within us. To be a spiritual seeker, we have had to leave the physical world. Enlightenment has been the reason for reclaiming spirit by denying the body, transcending form by leaving it. Thus, individual beings have become enlightened in the sense that they have fully realized their spiritual nature, but they have not fully integrated that enlightenment into their form. When they have eventually left their bodies, the world remained largely untransformed. These masters have supported and preserved the intuitive principle in our world and have paved the way for us to take the next step, the integration of feminine and masculine, spirit and form, and the subsequent transformation of our world. Those of us who choose to be spiritual seekers and transformers must now move into the world with the same degree of commitment to our spiritual selves as we would have if we renounced the world. This path is much more difficult. We are now challenged to surrender to the universe, to follow its guidance and to do so while having deep, passionate relationships, dealing with money, business, family, creative projects, and so many other, worldly, things. Rather than avoiding our attachments to the world, the time has come to acknowledge and work with them. We must move into the challenging situation, move into, recognize, and own all the feelings and attachment, and learn to embrace the full range of our experience. Meditation Relax, close your eyes, and take a few deep breaths. With each breath, drop more deeply into a quiet place inside yourself. From this place of calm, start to see a new image of yourself in the world. Your focus is on the universe and you follow its guidance. You trust yourself. You feel strong and courageous. You carry a sense of knowingness with you into the world. Because of this trust and focus within yourself, what you create on the outside is beautiful. Your world is nourishing to you and others. You are having deep, passionate relationships, and are dealing with people, money, your career, your body, and everything else around you. You are able to be in the world and enjoy all worldly things, yet keep your commitment to the universe within yourself. This commitment is reflected in the light and power you feel. Part 2. Living the Principles. Chapter 11 Trusting Intuition. Most of us have been taught from childhood not to trust our feelings, not to express ourselves truthfully and honestly, not to recognize that at the core of our being lies a loving, powerful, and creative nature. We learn easily to try to accommodate those around us, to follow certain rules of behavior, to suppress our spontaneous impulses, and to do what is expected of us. Even if we rebel against this, we are trapped in our rebellion, doing the opposite of what we've been told in a knee-jerk reaction against authority. Very seldom do we receive any support for trusting ourselves, listening to our own sense of inner truth, and expressing ourselves in a direct and honest way. When we consistently suppress and distrust our intuitive knowingness, looking instead for authority, validation, and approval from others, we give our personal power away. This leads to feelings of helplessness, emptiness, a sense of being a victim, and eventually to anger and rage, and, if these feelings are also suppressed, to depression and deadness. We may simply succumb to these feelings, and lead a life of quiet numbness. We may overcompensate for our feelings of powerlessness by attempting to control and manipulate other people and our environment. Or we may eventually burst forth with uncontrolled rage that is highly exaggerated and distorted by its long suppression. None of these are very positive alternatives. The true solution is to re-educate ourselves to listen to and trust the inner truths that come to us through our intuitive feelings. Following our inner guidance may feel risky and frightening at first, because we are no longer playing it safe, doing what we should do, pleasing others, following rules, or deferring to outside authority. To live this way is to risk losing everything that we have held onto for reasons of external, false, security, but we will gain integrity, wholeness, true power, 
creativity, and the real security of knowing that we are in alignment with the power of the universe. In suggesting that our intuition needs to be the guiding force in our lives, I am not attempting to disregard or eliminate the rational mind. The intellect is a very powerful tool, best used to support and give expression to our intuitive wisdom, rather than as we often use it, to suppress our intuition. Most of us have programmed our intellect to doubt our intuition. When an intuitive feeling arises, our rational minds immediately say, I don't think that will work, nobody else is doing it that way, or, what a foolish idea, and the intuition is disregarded. As we move into the new world, it is time to re-educate our intellect to recognize the intuition as a valid source of information and guidance. We must train our intellect to listen to and express the intuitive voice. The intellect is by nature very disciplined and this discipline can help us to ask for and receive the direction of the intuitive self. What does it mean to trust your intuition? How do you do it? It means tuning into your gut feelings, your deepest inner sense of personal truth, in any given situation, and acting on these feelings, moment by moment. Sometimes these, gut messages, may tell you to do something unexpected or inconsistent with your previous plans, they may require that you trust a hunch that seems illogical, you may feel more emotionally vulnerable than you are used to feeling, you may express thoughts, feelings, or opinions foreign to your usual beliefs, you may follow a dream or fantasy, or take some degree of financial risk to do something that feels important to you. At first you may fear that trusting your intuition will lead you to do things that seem somewhat hurtful or irresponsible to others. For example, you may hesitate to break a date, even though you need time for yourself, because you fear hurting your date's feelings. i found that when I really listen to and trust my inner voice, in the long run, everyone around me benefits as much as I do. People may sometimes be temporarily disappointed, irritated, or a bit shaken up as you change your old patterns of relating to yourself and others. But this is usually because as you change, the people around you are automatically pushed to change as well. If you trust, you will see that the changes are also for their highest good. If you do break that date, your friend may end up having a wonderful time doing something else. If they don't want to change, they may move away from you, at least for a while, therefore, you must be willing to let go of the forms of relationship you have with people. If there is a deep connection between you, chances are good that you will be close again in the future. Meanwhile, everyone needs to grow in their own way and their own time. As you continue to follow your path, you will increasingly attract people who like you as you are and relate to you in a way that feels honest, supportive, and appreciative. Practicing a new way of living learning to trust your intuition is an art form, and like all other art forms, it takes practice to perfect. You don't learn to do it overnight. You have to be willing to make mistakes, to try something and fail, then try something different the next time, and sometimes, perhaps, even embarrass yourself or feel foolish. Your intuition is always correct, but it takes time to learn to hear it correctly. If you are willing to risk acting on what you believe to be true, and risk making mistakes, you will learn very fast by paying attention to what works and what doesn't. If you hold back out of fear of being wrong, learning to trust your intuition could take a lifetime. It can be hard to distinguish the voice of our intuition from the many other selves that speak to us, from within, the different parts of ourselves that have their own idea of what's best for us. People frequently ask me how to differentiate the voice or energy of intuition from all the others. Unfortunately, there's no simple, surefire way at first. Most of us are in touch with our intuition whether we know it or not, but we're actually in the habit of doubting or contradicting it so automatically that we don't even know it has spoken. The first step in learning is to pay more attention to what you feel inside, to the inner dialogue that goes on within you. For example, you might feel, I'd like to give Jim a call. Immediately, a rational, doubting voice inside says, why call him at this time of day? He probably won't be home, and you automatically ignore your original impulse to call. If you had called, you might have found him at home, 
and discovered he had some important information for you. Another example, you might get a feeling in the middle of the day that says, I'm tired, I'd like to take a rest. You immediately think, I can't rest now, I have a lot of work to do. So you drink some coffee to get yourself going and work the rest of the day. By the end of the day you feel tired, drained, and irritable, whereas if you had trusted your initial feeling, you might have rested for half an hour and continued about your tasks, refreshed and efficient, finishing your day in a state of balance. As you become aware of this subtle inner dialogue between your intuition and your other inner voices, it's very important not to put yourself down or diminish this experience. Try to remain a somewhat objective observer. Notice what happens when you follow your intuitive feelings. The result is usually increased energy and power, and a sense of things flowing. Now, notice what happens when you doubt, suppress, or act against your feelings. Usually, you will observe decreased energy, you may feel somewhat disempowered or depressed. You may even experience emotional or physical pain. Whether or not you act on your intuitive feelings, you'll be learning something, so try not to condemn yourself when you don't follow your intuition, thus adding insult to injury. Remember, it takes time to learn new habits, the old ways are deeply ingrained. I've been working intensively on my own re-education for many years, and while the results I'm enjoying are wonderful, there are still times when I don't yet have the courage or awareness to be able to trust myself completely and do exactly what I feel. I'm learning to be patient and compassionate with myself as I gain the courage to be true to myself. Suppose you are trying to decide whether to change jobs. You might have a conservative self that feels it would be safest to stay where you are, an adventurous self that is eager to do something different, a self that is concerned about what other people will think, and so on. One way to handle this is to listen to each of these voices and write down what each has to say, perhaps using a different color pen for each one. Then, just let yourself sit with all the conflicting viewpoints for a while without trying to resolve them or make a decision. Eventually, you will start to get an intuitive sense of what your next step needs to be. As you get to know the different selves within you, you will discover that your intuitive self has an energy or a feeling that is different from the other voices. In time, you will learn to recognize it quite easily. One important step in learning to hear and follow your intuition is simply to practice checking in regularly. At least twice a day, and much more often, if possible, once an hour is great, take a moment or two, or longer, if you can, to relax and listen to your gut feelings. Cultivate this habit of talking to your intuitive self. Ask for help and guidance when you need it and practice listening for answers that may come in many forms, words, images, feelings, or even through being led to some external source such as a book, a friend, or a teacher who will tell you just what you need to know. Your body is a tremendous helper in learning to follow your inner voice. Whenever you feel your body is in pain or discomfort, it is usually an indication that you have ignored your feelings. Use it as a signal to tune in and ask what you need to be aware of. As you learn to live from your intuition, you give up making decisions with your head. You act moment by moment on what you feel and allow things to unfold as you go. In this way, you are led in the direction that is right for you, and decisions are made easily and naturally. If possible, try not to make big decisions concerning future events until you are clear about what you want. Focus on following the energy in the moment and you'll find that it will all be handled in its own time and way. When you must make a decision related to something in the future, follow your gut feeling about it at the time the decision needs to be made. Remember, too, that although I sometimes speak of following your inner intuitive voice, most people do not literally experience it as a voice. Often it's more like a simple feeling, an energy, a sense of, I want to do this, or, I don't want to do that. Don't make it into a big deal, a mysterious mystical event, a voice from on high. It's a simple, natural human experience that we have lost touch with and need to reclaim. The main sign that you are following your intuition in your life is increased aliveness. 
it feels like more life energy is flowing through your body. Sometimes it may even feel a little overwhelming, like more energy than your body can handle. You may even have the experience of feeling tired from too much energy coming through you. You won't bring through more energy than you can deal with, but it may stretch you a little. Your body's expanding its capacity to channel the universal energy. Relax into it and rest when you need to. Do things that help you stay grounded, such as physical exercise, being in nature, emotional self-nurturing, and eating healthy, substantial foods. Soon, you'll feel more balanced and you'll even begin to enjoy the increasing intensity. At first you may find that the more you act on your intuition, the more things in your life seem to be falling apart, you might lose your job, a relationship, certain friends, or your car might even stop working. You're actually changing rapidly and shedding the things in your life that no longer fit. As long as you refuse to let go of them, they imprisoned you. As you continue on this new path, following the energy moment by moment as best you can, you will see new forms begin to be created in your life, new relationships, new work, a new home, a new form of creative expression, or whatever. It will happen easily and effortlessly. Things will just fall into place, and doors will open in a seemingly miraculous way. You may have times when you will just go along, doing what you have energy to do, and not doing what you don't have energy to do, having a wonderful time, and you will, literally, be able to watch the universe creating through you. You're starting to experience the joy of being a creative channel. Specific Examples Here are a few examples from my life, and the lives of my friends and clients, of the types of situations you might be confronted with in following your intuition. Notice that the words in parentheses are the thoughts and feelings that might have held you back or stopped you from trusting your intuition in the past. Leaving a party or meeting because you realize you really don't want to be there, even though you're afraid of what others might think or you don't want to miss something good. Telling someone that you are attracted to him, or that you would like to get to know him, or that you love him, or whatever it is that you're feeling, because it feels good to be open and tell the truth, even though you're afraid of being rejected, and it makes you feel very vulnerable, and one part of you says, you're just not supposed to do that. Deciding not to write your thesis because you really don't feel very interested in it, every time you think about it, it feels like a terrible chore, even though you spent five years working toward it, and your parents will be upset if you don't get your degree, you'd really like to have the prestige, and you think you could get a better job with it. Taking singing lessons, music lessons, a dance class, or whatever interests you, because you have a fantasy that you would love to be able to sing, play an instrument, or dance, even though you don't think you have any talent, you're too old to learn now, or you might look foolish. Not going to work one day because you feel like you want a quiet day to yourself to hang around home, lie in the sun, take a walk, or even just lie in bed, even though you always go to work and think it's terribly irresponsible not to if you're not sick, or you're afraid you might lose your job, or you think it's silly or frivolous. Quitting your job because you hate it and you realize that you don't really need to do something that you don't like, even though you're not really sure that what you're going to do next and you'll only have enough money to last you for a few months, and you feel scared about not having the security of a regular income. Not doing a favor for someone who's asked you to because you really don't want to and you know you'd feel resentful if you did, even though you're afraid you're selfish, or you might lose a friend or antagonize a coworker. Spending a little money on something special for yourself or someone else, on impulse, just because it makes you feel good, even though you're normally very frugal, and you really feel maybe you can't afford it. Telling someone your opinion about something because you're tired of pretending to agree with others, even though you normally wouldn't dare express yourself that way. Telling your family that you're not cooking dinner because you just don't feel like it, even though you're afraid you're being a bad wife and mother and they all might find out they don't need you anymore and your whole identity will be shot. Not making a decision about something because you're not sure yet what you really feel about it, even though it makes you feel uncomfortable and off-balance to be in a state of indecisiveness. Starting your own business because you have a strong feeling inside that you can do it, even though you've never done anything like that before. Well, you've got the idea. 
Trusting your intuition means tuning in as deeply as you can to the energy you feel, following that energy moment to moment, trusting that it will lead you where you want to go and bring you everything you desire. It means being yourself, being real and authentic in your communications, being willing to try new things because they feel right, and doing what turns you on. Highly Intuitive People Many people are already highly developed intuitively. Some are very much in touch with their intuition, but are afraid to act on it in the world. Often, these people will follow their intuitive promptings in one specific area of their lives, but not in others. Many artists, musicians, performers, and other highly creative people fall into this category. They strongly trust and spontaneously act on their intuition within the bounds of their art form, thus, they are extremely creative and often very productive, but they don't have the same degree of self-trust and willingness to back their feelings with action in other areas of their lives, particularly in their relationships and in matters of business and money. Thus, we have the classic case of the artistic type who is chaotic and unbalanced emotional ly, and or inept or even exploited financially. A classic example of this problem was seen in the movie Lady Sings the Blues, based on the life of the great singer Billie Holiday. In one scene, she is traveling with her show on a grueling tour of the country. She is feeling exhausted and depleted and yearns to go home to see her husband and to rest. She resolves to cancel her tour and follow her heart. However, her business managers succeed in convincing her that this move would ruin her career, that she must continue on the road. Shortly after giving in to their arguments, she begins to indulge heavily in drugs. From that point on, her life takes a downward and tragic course. Naturally, one such incident does not ruin an entire life, but this movie provides a graphic illustration of the way many artists and performers give away their authority to other influences around them and suffer the resulting inner conflict, pain, and loss of power. In order to come into balance, these people must learn to trust their intuition and assert themselves in all areas of their lives. Many psychics also experience this problem. They are very open, receptive, and intuitive, and do not block these qualities as many of us have done. They may even give their intuition free reign in their work or under certain conditions. Once again, they may not fully trust and back their intuition in every moment of their lives, especially in the area of personal relationships. They may be too wide open to other people's energies and often do not know how to stay connected to their own individual feelings and needs, how to assert themselves, and how to set boundaries. From my experience, these highly sensitive people often have problems with their bodies, either weight problems or chronic illness. These problems are healed when they learn to balance their receptive, intuitive nature, feminine energy, with an equally developed willingness to act on their feelings and assert themselves in personal relationships, masculine energy. Many spiritual seekers who have spent a good deal of time meditating, becoming very sensitive and attuned to their energy, also have problems of imbalance. The seeker has a strong mental image of what it is to be spiritual, loving, open, and centered. He or she wants to act out this model at all times and thus is afraid to act spontaneously or express feelings honestly for fear that what comes out may be harsh, rude, angry, selfish, or unloving. Since we are human, as we risk expressing ourselves more freely and honestly, some of what comes out will be unpolished, distorted, foolish, or thoughtless. As we learn to act on our inner feelings, all the ways in which we've blocked ourselves in the past are cleared out, and in that process, a lot of old stuff comes to the surface and is released. Many old beliefs and emotional patterns are brought to light and healed. In this process, we have to be willing to face and reveal our unconsciousness. By the time we can see it, it's already changing anyway. If we pretend to be more together than we really are, we will miss the opportunity to heal ourselves. I have found this to be a very vulnerable and out of control feeling. I can't worry too much about how I'm presenting myself or how I look to others or whether I'm doing the right thing. I just have to be myself as I am now, 
as best I can, accepting the mixture of enlightened awareness and human limitation that is what I am right now. It isn't necessary to be perfect to be a channel for the universe. You just have to be real, be yourself. The more authentic, honest, and spontaneous you are, the more freely the creative force can flow through you. As it does so, it cleans out the remnants of old blockages. What comes out may sometimes be unpleasant or uncomfortable, but the energy moving through will feel great. The more you do this, the clearer your channel gets, so that what comes through is an increasingly perfect expression of the universe. Remember, too, that some of our spiritual models reflect our good ideas more than they reveal an accurate picture of enlightenment. The picture that many people have of wanting to be mellow, positive, and loving all the time is really an expression of their need to feel in control, good, and right. The universe has many colors, moods, speeds, styles, and direction, furthermore, they are all constantly changing. Only by letting go of some of our control and risking moving fearlessly with this flow will we get to experience the ecstasy of being a true channel. Exercise 1. Write down all the reasons you can think of for not trusting and following your intuition. Include on the list any fears you have about what might happen to you if you trust your intuition and act on it all the time. 2. Review the meditation at the end of the third chapter, the chapter on intuition, see page 42. 3. At least twice a day, more often if you can remember, take a minute to relax, close your eyes, and check in with your gut feeling to see if you are doing what feels right or if there's anything you need to be aware of. 4. For one day or one week, assume that your intuitive feelings about things are always 100% right and act as if that is so.